Hey everyone, welcome to this final Agronomists of 2021. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and uh, we're doing things just a little differently tonight. I'm going to have three guests instead of two, and we're going to be checking out the top agronomic stories of the year. But before we get to that, of course, we do want to send a big thank you to our show sponsor, uh, Adama Canada and Real Ag Radio. And of course, Mind Your Farm Business, a fantastic podcast. Um, it tackles everything from succession planning to farm management. And the latest episode talks about keeping your books up to date um, and using that to drive your business decisions, which is pretty fantastic. Real Ag Radio, I did want to send a shout out next week. I know it's the holiday week in between Christmas and New Year's, that strange time. Uh, but uh, Sean is working hard putting together the top interviews of the year. Um, and those will run Monday to Friday next week. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, Adama Canada, uh, our our very first sponsor that came on board. So we do thank them. Um, I'm going to do a quick read. Adama Canada, while other sources of innovation run dry, Adama is here to deliver, leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges. We're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today for more information. Okay, a few things about tonight. Yes, you can get your CEU credits as always. Head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists tomorrow and fill out that form. You have to scroll down a little to find it, but uh, please do that and let us know that you listened. Um, tonight, we also are going to be giving away Real Agriculture hats, which you're going to see in just a moment. Um, and to make sure you get your hat, everyone in the chat like warren and scott and francois john of course jason's here if you don't have a hat already please in the chat let us know what you think the top agronomic story of 2021 has been for your area um, or for your business and to make sure you get your hat i'm trying i'm going to try and keep track of all the comments and everybody but if in doubt please zip me an email at lsmith at realagriculture.com Thank goodness our company does not use our first names or no one would ever get an email to me. All right, so that's Elspeth at realagriculture.com. Okay, so without further ado, hey, Lara's here. She's joining us from way far away on vacation. Hi, Lara. Um, all right, so to cap off the year, to talk about the biggest agro agronomic stories of the year, I have Peter Weepeat Johnson, resident agronomist with Real Agriculture, Bernard Tobin, field editor with Real Agriculture, and Jeremy Boyton, not with Real Agriculture, but with Alberta Wheat and Barley Commissions. Welcome here, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Right. Going to be a blast tonight, Lindsay. We're going to give you as hard a time as we can. Oh, <laughs> I I expect it. All right. So, but we show, we Pete, show off the hat a little bit. There you go, everybody. Okay. So, Ooh. Jim Hale. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, so, Jim... <laughs> Um, Jim is listing his top story of the year, and it is fertilizer prices uh, coming in at a close second. Fertilizer prices. So that now, I'm Jim. I'm a little surprised that that's where you're going with this because I would have thought it'd be drought, and yet it's fertilizer prices. So that's. Uh, I mean, I suppose they're somewhat related, but we are going to talk a bit more about that. Uh, Pete, are you surprised by that? So, so the drought, we, we're eternal optimists. We're farmers, we're agronomists, we work in agriculture. It's such a tough place to be. The drought is old news. It, by next year, it won't be a drought. It's going to be a perfect year. And the only thing that matters then is fertilizer prices. So Jim is a bang on, no doubt about it. All right, Jeremy, what do you think? What do you think of that? I I think Pete's an eternal optimist to think one one and done. I don't know. The, everything I hear is, you know, we're the expectation is three years, but uh, you know, I, I I hope you're right. I hope next year we get we get some good rain and, and this helps. But you're right. I mean, this is, you know, we saw it in the '90s, we saw it in the '80s, we saw it previous to that. You know, this is this is a story as old as agriculture in Western Canada. Um, you know, managing drought is something that these producers uh, have 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 managed to do. Um, but now with high fertilizer prices, it just adds a, a factor in there that that just really ups the ante in terms of challenge. So I, I completely agree with them. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll get we'll get to some of that tonight for sure. But Bern, I want to go to you today on mm -hmm. realagriculture.com. We posted 
the last soybean school of the year. Tell us what Horace Bonner shared in that uh, well, soybean school. Um, a, a record. Uh, a record for soybean yield in Ontario was 51.6 bushels per acre. And what's interesting about that, Lindsay, is uh, the, the bigger context here. I mean, what Horst also said was Ontario's five-year average now sits at about 49 bushels, right? And that five-year average obviously moves. But comparatively speaking, the U.S. is at 50 bushels per acre and Brazil at 52. So, hey, there's Ontario right in the middle of that. Uh, that's a pretty, that's a horse race right there. And, uh, you know, from genetics to the management that growers employ uh, north of the border, or, uh, border here, I mean, that is pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Well, and especially when you add in the fact that latitude is one of the most important things in soybean yield. So the further north you go, the lower the soybean yields are. And we all know that the U.S. has way more southerly latitudes and Brazil is close to the equator. So you just kind of go like, man, you just all you need is an amazing soybean specialist like Horst Bonner and and anything can happen. So look out, Alberta. You got Jeremy Boychin. Things are going to move in wheat and barley in Alberta. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, they are. I mean, Jeremy can't work miracles, though, Pete. I mean, there needs to be some rain. Okay. Oh yeah. So Lara, Lara did over mention. It. Get over it. <laughs> Lara mentions that if it is another dry year, you better be flexible because you're putting your foot in your mouth. So there you go. That <laughs> she's, you know, holidays are getting to her head. I think she's getting sassy. Um, absolutely. Okay. So, but that was, of course, I mean, big stories this year for sure. The drought, fertilizer prices. We're going to talk about that some more. We've talked about it here on the show as well about anticipating fertility needs for next year based on the drought. So we'll talk a bit more about that. But Bern, I want to go back to you because I want to hit on perhaps one of the videos that got the most attention all year is a soil school that you ah. did. So, and and I, I actually haven't checked the numbers and I don't want to destroy my internet connection. So I'm not going to check it now, but it's a lot. Just take my word for it. Okay. So, but which soil school, which topic is it? Why do you think it has resonated so much this yeah. year? Well, you know, the soil school is really interesting because it gets tremendous numbers. You know, I think, you know, everybody out there wants to know uh, about their soil and how to manage it better. And uh, cr incredible numbers for a video uh, with uh, Jody DeYoung Hughes out of the University of Manitoba, soil extension uh, specialist. And we talked about um, does organic matter really matter? And, uh, you know, I, you know and I think everybody's sort of digging into their soil these days, wanting to know what percentage organic matter they've got. Can How can they get more? Pete and I have talked about it a lot. And, uh, you know, what that 2%, that 3%, that 4% means. And, uh, you know, she had some great in in insights. And, uh, you know, basically she had, uh, you know, the difference, you know, between in, in water holding capacity, for example. So, I mean, like if, uh, uh, if, if you've got 4% organic matter, you've got eight days of water holding capacity and stress conditions for corn and drought. If you're down to 2% organic matter, that's four days. So half, right? Um, so some pretty incredible stuff there. And, uh, you know, um, that's that's water infiltration as well, right? So you, you, it's, it's, when we get to water for infiltration, when you've got high organic matter, right, uh, you and in a strip till situation, for example, um, you can get 2.5 inches of water through that uh, down through that uh, that that soil profile compared to about a half hour um, sorry about a half, about a half inch um, mm -hmm. you know uh, when it comes to uh, you know you know that that water infiltration so everybody sort of grabbed onto it wanted to do mm -hmm. wanted to have a look at that and she also did NP and K so uh, and, and the value of NP and K and uh, that soil's ability uh, at one percent organic matter to sort of you know make more NPK uh, and sulfur available, and she pegged that one percent at six hundred and sixty dollars US. So right. all around, yeah, and, and and maybe just just to to be clear, because Bern, I think you said University of Manitoba. Un unfortunately, we Minnesota. can't claim her as a Canadian. Minnesota. She's yeah. an American. She is Good Minnesota. Head, Minnesota, yeah. They're, they're so close together, though, really. I mean, it's basically all the same. Uh, no, it, it is that that video has done incredibly well. It gets tons of comments still. And that is one of the, the wonderful things about YouTube, of course, is that 
someone goes down a YouTube spiral and all of a sudden is watching, you know, video after video. And we get comments sometimes on videos from years ago, which are always great. Pete, don't read the comments. Um, <laughs> no, I, I should say that actually. Some of them, though, um, most of the time, it's where do you get, where does that man get his energy and how do I bottle it? So that's that's always a good one. Now, um, I do, there are a couple of really great comments here. So Patrick says the biggest story, uh, or one of the biggest stories, land values apparently are jumping fast. Uh, Adelaide Clay just sold for 26000 an acre, um, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and uh, Francois Tardif says disruption of supply chains was big in 2021 and will likely continue in 2022 affects primary producers and consumers alike. Absolutely. So Jeremy, I'll go to you on this one. Um, on the disruption side, of course, we have talked fertilizer. Um, how concerned are producers about just crop inputs in general and having access to what they're going to want and need in 2022? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> you know, the discussions out there and there is concern coming from from some of the local retailers of, hey, make sure you're putting your order in. Um, you know, we even saw delays last year in terms of, of getting product on site. Um, so I think there's just general unrest and unsureness of, of what things are going to look like prices are going up and and i think even at the retail level they're not exactly sure what things are going to look like so this is causing a little bit of a, of a stir um so far i haven't heard of anyone not being able to get product um so i think you know the cost of that product is probably at this point the biggest impact other than you know the concern of is something going to come in but um you know there's always those those big question marks around glyphosate and glufosinate is it going to come in am i going to get enough um but as of right now i think you know those that i have talked to have got product in um or they're you know they, it's on order and, and it and should be coming in so um i think Producers are aware, uh, but the big thing is, is, you know, have that plan B, have that plan C, you know, if, if this is a product that you're unsure what's going to come in, you know, know how that's going to cause an impact and what trickle down effect that's going to have. Um, and then, then you can think about, and you know, the examples we could run through, but you know, if, if you can't get product A, you know, what are your secondary options that you can have? Um, and maybe not thinking about brands in particular, but actives. What actives do I need to target to get what I need done? Um, because sometimes it can be a, a, you know brand specific where we're having challenges. So if we can target those actives and making sure we're getting those on farm to still get the results we need, um, you know that can help us move forward. So um, I think it's there's rumblings there, but uh, I think we're still getting product in slowly at uh, a much higher price, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, Jeremy, you're asking for almost the holy grail because next you're going to tell us that we should be seeding in, you know, seeds per acre. But you're saying to talk in actives. Are you kidding me? Come on. No. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I will say this is one of the ones that I think, you know, especially as some things came off patent or whatever, we got a lot better at talking in actives versus brand names. Um, but I will say, Pete, when, when you or Peter Sikama or or Mike Cobra start rattling off all these trade names. I honestly have no idea. I'm like, tell me the active because those are the things that I like had drilled into me that you should always think in actives, not in trade names. So, uh, so there you go. Um, so now Steve Sickle does says that he took delivery of the 2022 chemical needs today. Would rather uh, look at it than look for it. So if you've got the appropriate storage, I say go at it. Just make sure you've got the right storage to do it. Um, but I think that's probably not a bad idea. Um, kind of a crappy Christmas gift, though, really, if you think about it. Anyway, don't uh, get your significant other. It, it's uh, a great Christmas, Christmas really? present to yourself, Lindsay. An absolute <laughs> great <laughs> Christmas present to yourself. Because now you're secure, right? Although now, I, you make yeah. a... You're really a really good point. For goodness sakes, you know some of these chemicals don't like to be to be frozen. If you don't have proper storage, yeah. be a little bit careful. You know, especially on the liquid products, you, you gotta you gotta pay attention to what you can store and what you can't, and and put yeah. it in a safe place. You know, that's the, I guess the other thing. We had a lot of push for for proper chemical storage in Ontario for a long time. If it's sitting out in your shop so it doesn't freeze, 
and all of a sudden the shop catches on fire some some real safety concerns around that so well i totally get why steve did it and and it's a great christmas present for himself just make sure you're taking the right safety precautions yeah absolutely all right um Warren Schneckenberger, Farmer Schneck, is on, and uh, you'd think I slipped him a 20, but I didn't. But uh, he wants to talk about kernel weight versus test weight. And lo and behold, we have a video clip from this year's Sharp Edge series that tackles exactly this. So, Warren, thank you for that excellent segue into our very first clip. Um, and so this is one that, that, Pete, I've watched it a couple times, and I still just shake my head a little. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so I just, I, because Warren hit the nail on the head, right? Like, like he's, it's no hat for Warren. Warren should get better than a hat, baby. It's oh, real egg swag, the real egg hoodie. Come on. I don't know for that. Oh, we got the tea. There you go. No, I don't, Pete, hoodies? It's real egg.com. Get real, get there connected. You go. I'm, I need, I need three more sponsors if we're going to start sending out hoodies. <laughs> okay. Um, although it is kind of perfect. So there you go. Okay. So. Producer Jay, if you could queue up uh, that uh, video for us, we do want to talk about test weight versus kernel weight and confuse me even further. Greg, we are going to make growers sharper today by helping them understand how to get more yield. Uh, and understand is the key word, Pete, because we're going to talk about test weight versus kernel weight because the two do not mean the same thing and they often get us confused when we're trying to understand where corn yield is coming from. Yeah, I'm not sure you even understand yield at all, Greg, because I was with a grower, you were there, you on the yield tour, your oh, famous yeah. yield tour, right? And you counted corn kernels and you, 225 was your yield estimate. We took the plot off the other day, 265, uh, man, you're yeah. out. Well, that can only mean, right, that uh, the mass of the kernels, the actual weight of the kernels, the size of the kernels was heavier than we had, what we had estimated. Because we can count, right? Everyone at Mazex can count. Well, we can, maybe not you. Well, maybe not me, <laughs> but we can count ears, we can count kernels, but you have to sort of estimate what the kernel mass is going to be. And so if we miss the kernel mass, and this year there is some heavy corn out there, right, big kernels, and if you miss that, 225 turns into 265. So wait a minute, kernel mass, so the yield components on, on the corn are cons consist of what, Greg? Ear count, rows around, and length, so you get total kernel number, and then an estimation of what those kernels weigh. How many kernels does it take to make a bushel? Right, so if, if I have those big heavy kernels, I get to 265, right? Right. right. But if I have those big heavy kernels, not only do I get to 265, I'm gonna have what, 55 pound test weight? Ah, uh, only we wish, right? It doesn't happen that way. In fact, the, some of those 265 growers come back and complain to me and say, well, yeah, you missed it real bad, but why do I have 51 pound per bushel corn when my yields are through the roof? Because the size of the kernel does not necessarily mean how well they fit into a half liter cup to give you test weight or density. So in actual fact, the 265 that the grower weighed was 51 pound test weight. Yeah. His comment was 51 pounds, that's pretty sad. If only, if only we could have had a 56 pound test weight, that's basically 10% more yield. Add 10% onto 265, man, that's yield. That's pushing 292, <laughs> 300 is in the, in the range. Right on. Well, unfortunately, it just doesn't add up that way when you're doing yield component. Test weight isn't even part of the discussion. It's how heavy the kernels are. Whether they fit into a, whether they fit into a density cup well or not so well, it's a different story. But I have a nice example of, of that same sort of idea. I've got a couple of hybrids on the table, 40-40, 20 rows around right 36 rows long that's a lot of kernels yep. nice right? cur nice cobs yep. and then i put it up against 4158 generally 14 16 rows around and isn't long enough to give you more cobs to, to more kernels it's generally about 50 kernels short of the 4040 in this example so but the 4040 is going to yield more it's got more kernels on yield tour this wins right 
you get to the combine, and if these kernels are much heavier, not test weight heavier, mass heavier, what a thousand kernels weigh, as an example, then this one goes shooting past this hybrid, not because of kernel number or ear count, but because of how heavy the kernels are. Okay, oh, Pete. So I just, I just want to point out that Vern had to film that video, and filming that video, he says, is what was that like, Vern? It was like a refereeing a heavyweight title fight. It was two guys. <laughs> there was not. <clears throat> I don't think Woodstock was big enough for two of them that day. For the two of you, that's quite the headgear you got there, Pete. I like it. This is absolutely oh, man. gotta fit. In the bill, baby. I I had Did no idea that we were going to wardrobe changes. I mean, where uh, was that memo? Anyway, okay. It must be maple Please. syrup season over there. I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're just a few months away, Jeremy. A few months. Or, Got to hold up. Or maybe okay. Too much beer yeah. season. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's curling season, isn't it? It's something like that. It's okay, curling it's always. Season, yep. Yeah. Okay. So here we are. We, we actually got to clip one here on The Agronomist brought to you by Adama Canada. Thanks so, uh, to our sponsor who did not um, fit the bill for, for Pete's outfits, unfortunately. Um, but we'll work on that. But Pete, walk us through this again because, because Warren's right. There was so much controversy about kernel weight, test weight, yield, all these things. So just walk us through again. It's kernel weight that really makes yield. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it is such a tough concept for growers to get their mind around because when you haul that truck load and you have 43 ton in the 40 ton truck, you're just saying, baby. And then you haul the next truck load and you got 38 ton and you're just thinking, well, this stuff is crap. And so we all have this concept that test weight, and it's a it's been a quality parameter, and so everybody thinks it really matters, but it's it's a volume. Why does that truck hold forty three ton? It's it's the volume, and so it's actually the weight of the kernels that make the difference. So so you need numbers of kernels, and you need those kernels to weigh, and the test weight component is totally separate to that. It's how do they fit in the cup? Are they nice and on all flat and fit together tightly in that cup and they're, they're waxy and so they slide down past each other and they just pack in there like gravel? Or are they oblong and funny shaped and not waxy at all and they kind of hang up on each other and then your test weight goes, goes to crap because you don't get as many kernels in there but your yield and your kernel weight is can really still be outstanding and greg greg stewart has been doing some really cool stuff with that he's been trying to track kernel weight versus yield and he's 100 percent weight in, right rather in most trials kernel weight matches yield reasonably well and then you get hybrids just like he talked about that 40 40 it just has so many kernels that even though the kernels aren't that heavy, the thing still yields. So there's three components. It's number of cobs, it's kernels per cob, and it's weight per kernel. But in that calculation, bushel weight doesn't matter. Get over it. It just doesn't count. All right. Well, John says, I've always said you don't know what your yield is until you have all the way slips. So there you go. You got to take it all the way. So it, it is a big one. It is one of those... Um, you know, we, this this discussion does come up in other crops, though, as well, right? I mean, we do have this discussion with test weight in wheat, especially if it's been rained on, right? If it's been mature, it gets rained on, it dries. Walk me through it again. And Jeremy, I'm sorry. I know you guys didn't get any rained on wheat this year. But um, what happens to test weight when wheat gets rained on? Yeah, so, so wheat is a different beast. And if you think about it, as corn dries down, when it rains, the corn doesn't go up in moisture. It's got to rain for a week for that for that corn to gain even a half a point in moisture. And if it's at 28% and it rains all week, it'll still be 27% at the end of the week. It's still drying down. Whereas wheat is a totally different animal. Wheat sucks up moisture, I, I don't know, just, just 
just the way burn sucks up beer or something like that right like <laughs> just it it just it, it, at the end of the day as the humidity goes up the stinking weed will be at 14 percent moisture at I don't know, 7.30 at night and the humidity comes in and by nine o'clock, the stupid stuff back at 18% moisture, just humidity and it's gaining moisture. Every time it re-wets, it's the, the kernel swells up and when it shrinks back down, you get these microscopic little wrinkles in the kernels. And so the first time it's nice, smooth kernels. I talked about waxy fit in the cup, nice, smooth kernels. They slide past each other. They fit tightly together, you know, just, just as tight as they can be. And so they go really good test weight. Every time it re-wets and you get those little wrinkles, now all of a sudden they're not fitting as good together and they're not going in the cup as well. And so you lose about one pound in test weight every rainstorm that the wheat sits in the field and we actually we've done some trials here in ontario really nice trial up the new lisker district that was done a few years back and it was it was stinking amazing it was one pound in test weight every rainstorm they got and they went from 62 pound test weight down to 57 pound test weight five rains bingo there you have it mm -hmm. there you go all right uh john has pointed out burn you gave yourself away that well, you may be from from points east where uh, are you from bernard um like a good professional wrestler i am from parts unknown so. <laughs> <laughs> no a good uh mr I, I think i think this john has got it right i'm an original i'm a newfoundlander of course yeah absolutely um and he is our resident newfie there is uh unfortunately no budget that goes with that but we certainly are always entertained I get now, if, someone, if, if someone came in right now and saw this show, I mean, if they were to throw a guess at who the newfie was on this panel, <laughs> I, I'm just saying they might not point towards Burn. <laughs> well, uh, I see uh, Pete, Pete is doing Canada proud. That's what I got. He really is, as per usual. Yeah, it's Feel pretty like fantastic. He just got back from the curling rink. <laughs> yeah, exactly. See? Yeah, very Canadian. Yeah. Now, I think he took so a few rocks, Vote, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So Jason Vote brought up one of his top stories of this year. And Jeremy, this this probably makes you a little nervous because it was surprising to me. But the Palmer Amaranth that was found in Manitoba uh, was found not far from where, uh, Jason, where Jason actually does work. And... Now, I know Manitoba is a long way from Alberta, but I mean, a weed like that creeping north is is troubling for sure. So so when you see something like that, Jeremy, what's what's sort of your first inclination on that one? Yeah, it is. It is a little bit uh, distant from us, but it still hits very close to home to really anyone producing in Canada, right? Knowing how easily these things can can get across the border and and, you know, as much as that line is there. Um, I, you know, we're still always at risk and we need to keep ourselves prepared, um, and ready to be on the lookout for, for resistant weeds coming north. So, you know, <clears throat> one of the first things I think of is, you know, producers need to be scouting. They need to be monitoring. They need to see what's in their fields. Hopefully they're doing this anyway, seeing what weeds that they have in their field, which ones are getting through when they do a herbicide application. So that way, I mean, the best thing we can do is stop it from spreading. That's the goal at this point. Um, you know, how spread is this issue? Um, and if we can stop it or slow it down, um, you know, that's going to be our, our main goal at this point to slow it down as much as possible um, or in, manage it uh, um, in any way we can. So, um, yeah, not not too close to home, but certainly certainly adds some a little bit of fear. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Burn, yeah, Burn, uh, you've you've tackled this one down in the States and, of course, in Ontario quite a bit. You've done one video, I think. I, I the person's name escapes me right now, but yeah. he actually put sort of a dollar value. Yeah, Willard Jack. Um, Willard Jack, from the, you know, uh, was a farmer here in Ontario for many, many years. Headed down to the U.S., um, set up shop, and we interviewed him here on the show. Oh, about four or five years ago, he'd come up to speak at SWAC at the Southwest Ag Conference. Peter, you'll remember. Mm -hmm. And Willard told the story of, uh, you know, the the battle 
that is Palmer Amaranth and, men- and managing that weed on his farm in the U.S. at seventy dollars an acre is what he tagged it at. Uh, that is that is the basically the bottom line on his treatment seventy dollars an acre. Yeah. And if you don't if you don't manage it. So my son Joel worked down in in out of uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, for a while, and there were growers in Georgia when Palmer first hit, and they didn't know how to control it. They actually ended up going through and and just chopping entire cotton fields down, not able to harvest them. The Palmer was so bad, and you look at at uh, water hemp here in in Ontario. If you don't control water hemp, it's almost as bad as Palmer. Maybe not quite. It's not as tall. But quit denying you have it. Dang it. Get out in the field and scout. If you if you see a pigweed escape that you're going, man, that herbicide program I used, it's pretty good on pigweed. How come that pigweed is out there? It's not probably pigweed. It's probably water hemp. Scout and quit denying that you have it. Everybody wants to be an ostrich, stick their head in the sand. That just doesn't work. Yeah, and, and then Willard, as soon as you get that combine, sorry, sorry, Bert, I'm what? just, I'm thinking, you know, you, you ignore it, that weed comes up, you know, it puts out seed, and then all of a sudden we're 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 putting a combine through there. How far are we tossing those seeds out? We're spreading the issue. It just so quickly it can become a concern. Um, and you know, I, you think about kosha and, and wild oats in in Alberta, and it's you know these things they can just perpetuate so quickly. So being diligent on monitoring and scouting your fields and being aware of where weeds are breaking through is going to be your best defense at this point um and preventing it from being an an enormous issue and and you know encouraging your neighbors to do the same because sometimes in ag uh your neighbor's issue is also your issue (laughs) eventually yeah oh yeah and i was going to say willard um you know willard willard was pretty you know, pretty proactive on it. And uh, 12,000 acres now in Mississippi uh, throughout his farm. And it is uh, across every field, every farm. So that's the battle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I do want to, so now, because Bern, you're you're likely going to hop off here pretty soon. We're going to. Oh, I can, I can hang around if, if it'll let okay, me. If you'll let me stay. She's I'm trying to get rid of them. You are more than welcome. She I just, just thought has maybe, a well, problem yeah, with I, the, the Newfoundlanders, I, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. if I figure I stay, that means P- Pete's picture is going to be smaller, right? So. <laughs> right, well, then, thank you. Look at that. He's he's doing us a solid. I thought you had a cod go. Forever the executive like producer. You know that. Yeah. So. <laughs> 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 Okay, so I do want to, um, I want to move a bit into some of the Western issues this year for sure, Um, because we do have a lot of good news stories, I think, out of the East this year. We had a terrific year. Soybeans did well. Corn did well. Um, Pete, all apologies, of course. We did not get a million acres of wheat in, um, and what did get in isn't all going to make it, but we did okay in the East. The West is a bit of a different story, but there is a wheat story that sort of is in both and so i bring this up in the east of course the wheat crop did well but we had lodging even where we used pgrs and then of course jeremy you were you've done some work on pgrs in the west and we had sort of here there a bit of controversy maybe on on the straightforwardness of how well they worked or did not work or these sorts of things so um jay do we have that clip we have a clip on pgrs right Producer Jay, maybe he's going to answer. Maybe. So, Kara, right now there are two plant growth regulators available for wheat in Alberta, Western Canada. That is Manipulator and Modus. Uh, Manipulator, the gibberellin biosynthesis inhibitor, uh, is staged for Zadox growth stage 31 32. And Modus, is staged for growth stage, Zadox growth stage 30 to 32. So a little bit wider on that modus. And when we're talking about growth stage 31, 32 on the Zadox scale, that is uh, sometimes referred to as first and second node. And when we're talking about growth stage, Zadox growth stage uh, 30 to 32, um, that's the beginning of stem elongation to second node. And for anyone who works on the BBCH scale, uh, it's the same as a Zadox scale. So Zadox scale 31, 32 would be the same as BBCH 31, 32. Um, So those are the, the two different timings for manipulator and modus. 
So why is it important that we're actually following these uh, timing? Why is it crucial to have it within that window? Yeah, so uh, these are very particular products and when it comes with comes to application. Um, so getting the right timing means you're gonna get the most out of that product. Uh, so we can't, because there's so many factors that determine the, the growth of wheat, um, we can't just say it's going to be a certain amount of days after seeding. <clears throat> and we also can't say it's going to be after a certain amount of leaves or when a certain amount of leaves are out. Uh, we can give a general kind of guideline where around three to four leaf stage, you're gonna to wanna to start monitoring to see whether you're getting close. Um, but you really need to get in and cut that, that plant open um, and see whether you're at that growth stage 30 to 32 or 31 to 32, depending on the product that you're using to make sure you're getting the most out of your product. Um, so this means that, uh, you know, if you're applying a PGR, you're you're going to want to go in at PGR timing um, and and uh, you know it's not always going to align with your herbicide timing and, and vice versa. So talk me through it you're gonna go out to your field and you're gonna pull up these plants what are you actually looking for when it comes to that timing? So as always when you're going into your field you're want, going to want to look in representative parts of your field and when you get there, you're gonna pull up a couple of plants uh, and you're gonna look for that main tiller. Um, what you're doing is finding that main tiller and you're gonna strip all the extra tillers off of the side of that main tiller and you're gonna strip any of the extra leaves off of there. Um, once you get that, you're going to feel down from the uh, from the top part of that stem all the way down. And what you're feeling for when you get to the bottom part of that stem is a little bump, uh, and that's going to be a little node initiating. Um, if you don't feel that yet, uh, it either means you're not um, you know, not, not able to feel it. Uh, it's, it can be kind of small sometimes on wheat, um, but if you can feel it, that means you want to split that stem open and look to see where the nodes are at. Uh, so the very bottom where the roots meet the stem is going to be your tillering node. And the way we gauge what growth stage you're at is going to be how many nodes are above that tillering node in the stem and how far those nodes are away from the tillering node. So when you only have that tillering node at the bottom and you can see that little head um, and, and it's starting to elongate, you can't feel any other nodes, you're at growth stage 30. Um, as that starts to grow up, you'll feel one individual node. When that gets to one, more than one centimeter away from the tillering node, that means you are at growth stage 31. It's going to continue to push up and you're gonna get a new node that's gonna develop in between that first node and below the little head that you can see there in that stem. When that one develops and is at, at two centimeters above that initial node, which would be above then that tillering node, then you're at growth stage 32. So tillering node, first node at one centimeter above, and then the second node above that, which is two centimeters above, and then you'll see your little head is going to be at growth stage 32. So you really want to be hitting um, manipulator in that growth stage 31 to 32 and modus in that growth stage 30 to growth stage 32. I'd like to say that, um, you know, when we're doing this for either wheat or barley, I know this is a wheat school, uh, that the the way to identify growth stage on barley is going to be the same for wheat. Uh, it might be a little bit more obvious because the nodes are a little bit bigger on barley, but the process is going to be the same. The growth stages uh, are going to be different, so make sure you look at the labels to make sure you're, you're doing the right timing for the right crop with the right product. I got it. <laughs> this is amazing. I wish I had more clips now because now I want to know how many hats he's got, you know? Um, all right, so Peter. we've got a few, a few comments have come in. Um, oh, one of which is uh, we do have some friends watching from Brazil, which is wonderful, welcome here. Um, and we've also got um, that John says, Jeremy, you look nervous, but don't worry, Warren suggests that perhaps Kara is scary, which if anyone has ever you met Kara. You don't see the whip not. she has behind the camera. <laughs> The death stare she gives. Watching you that realize, video again. Think uh, it, you realize like <laughs> Warren Warren just lost all of his real egg swag you were going to send him with that remark. Like Kara is scary. Are you kidding me? You're done, Warren. You're like you just no no real egg swag for no. Warren. Full stop. No. And although I will point out Kara did want to actually join us for this show. 
Um, but I hope I'm not oversharing. She had a dentist appointment today and said that she would probably be like a chipmunk and drooling. <laughs> so we decided that wasn't the best way for her to join us on the agronomist. So she will do that again. But Fair we enough. do, of course, um, Jeremy, you get to work with her quite a bit, which is great. Um, so let's let's go back to the this PGR question, because, of course, this is one East and West was was sort of an interesting one this year. Uh, so, Jeremy, I'll start with you, though. There's certainly I mean, there were some questions about, you know, was it worth it? Was it not? Um, but we didn't necessarily always have a trial set up to be looking at it. So what was the experience this year with PGRs? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'll comment on that video first. It, it, that video was was really intended to be ideal timing. Um, you know, Modus and Manipulator have wider timings than that on the label. Yeah. But when we're looking at what research has shown has been the, the best results, the optimal timing, those are the timings we look at. You know, Modus has a split application that could go as early as, as growth stage 21 and and uh, late as late as growth stage 39. So there is a wider window with both of those products, but, um, you know, that's where we see the optimal timing. But yeah, I mean, the real the question at hand, and I think, I think it's, it, it, you know, talking about what happened in the East in terms of wheat and such high yields, but having all of that lodging occurs, I think really speaks to what we try and talk about with PGRs in Western Canada is they're a tool, not a solution. They are going to help reduce lodging. They're going to mitigate moderate lodging with some genetics but they're not a silver bullet and this needs to be kept in mind. Um, you know, and, and, and when we're looking at genetics, I think it's very easy to look at, you know, at least in Alberta and Saskatchewan, you look at the seed guide and you say, okay, well, this variety is, is fair on lodging and this variety variety is good on lodging. So I'm probably going to want to use modus on the, the fair lodging because it's probably going to lodge a little bit more. But what we've seen with, with genetic response is actually that, this isn't the case. Um, you know, some varieties that are rated low on the lodging scale actually don't really respond to a modus application and some that are higher on the lodging scale when they're in high moisture, high fertility, high stress situations in terms of lodging, they're more likely to respond to a PGR. So it, it you really need to be doing your own trials on your own farm, do your strip trials. I'm going to sound like Peter, but do your strip trials, <laughs> do your strip trials. That's the only way. I mean, we're talking about genetics. We're talking about environment. We're talking about management. These things are going to differ on each farm. And the best way to get an idea of whether the value of a PGR is worth it on your farm is to leave strips, do replications if you can, randomize if you can. This is going to help you get a value or get an, get an understanding of the value with the crops that you're, that you're putting in. Um, you know, we saw... We saw drought this year that was, you know, rather significant. We saw enormous amounts of heat. We saw a significant lack of moisture. Um, and this puts enormous pressure on the crop. Um, Modus was released this year. A lot of applications happened on barley. Barley in itself is a very sensitive crop to stress. So we saw what was perceived or what we can say is some some additional negative stress that came from that extra metabolism from a pgr application um and some places saw a negative response and i was you know you mentioned i was part of some trials you know i had some replicated trials that was in a, a high stress high heat situation that we didn't see a lot of negative effects um so i think it went both ways uh and um i think the the amount of negative impact that happened on the crop may be kind of correlated to the amount of negative impact that that you know modus may have had on that crop but um you know i think there's still a lot of information coming in um, and there's still a lot to figure out but i think the take-home message from this is to we need to have more PGR hesitancy. Um, and I, I'm stealing that quote from Sherry Stryhorse. You know, she is the PGR expert. She did a lot of research on, mm -hmm. on different varieties and when to use it and how to use it. Um, so I'm definitely speaking, uh, coming from uh, speaking with her on this knowledge, but <clears throat> um, we really need to be cautious about when we're using it. If we think that there's any potential stress that's happening on that crop, we're not in conditions where lodging is extremely likely. Um, we're not seeing a lot of moisture. Um, you know, we really need to think about, is this a useful tactic at this point? Um, 
you know, when we're talking about impact of PGR, it takes two to four weeks or even more for the plant to metabolize that, that active. So during that time, if we get extreme stress, uh, it could be negatively impactful to that crop. So I think, um, I think this was a certainly a learning year when it came to PGRs in Western Canada. So I'm curious what Pete has to say uh, yeah. with the wheat in Eastern <laughs> Cause, Canada. Cause then I'm, we go the <laughs> I have on here for, <laughs> no, but, for 15 minutes, I think. I'm curious to see yeah, what he has no, to say. No, but it, I mean, this is this is one of the great things about why we can come together and have these discussions and compare notes. But Pete, I mean, we did have a pretty remarkable growing season this year in the East. And PGRs got used and we still had major lodging problems. So, would, so what were your observations as far as, is there just a huge genetic component? Is it the variety? Is it the conditions? What do you think, you know, contributed to that? And and yes to all the above, Lindsay. You should just be on here by yourself because you named all no, the factors. No, but I'm here every week. Bring the questions. All right. <laughs> so for the next two weeks. So but anyway. no, but what what really astounded me, and and we t we have some video of this. Burn Burn shot some video at the Syngenta Research Farm. We did some trials, and it was astounding. Like uh, Jeremy talks about the the difference in varietal response. Well, it's not just the difference in varietal response, but it's the difference in, in response to modus and it's a difference in response to manipulator. Varieties don't always respond the same mm -hmm. to both of those two growth regulators. And I've been working with growth regulators, regulators since, I don't know, 2008, something like that. And I learned more this year, even with that amount of, of information that we, we already had generated than I'd ever seen before. We took wheat that without a growth regulator on it was 48 inches tall, four feet tall. It didn't lodge because it's a variety that actually has very good standability, but we had 250 pounds of nitrogen on it. And so it grew tall and rank and, and we put a growth regulator on it under adverse weather conditions. It went from four feet high to 18 inches high. We, we more than halved the height. Like, I looked at that and said, oh my gosh, we've wiped it out. This is disastrous. Well, from a straw yield perspective, we probably did reduce the straw yield. The grain yield, we hardly reduced the grain yield at all. And you just go, how can that be? But what we, what we really learned, a, a few things. In wheat in Ontario, and I think in, throughout the Great Lakes Basin, winter wheat through the, the more uh, humid part of North America, Man, planting date has a way bigger impact on lodging potential than we gave it credit for. We planted wheat on time last, uh, the, like in 2000 and uh, the fall of 2020. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that wheat, we had so many heads per square foot, just record number of heads per square foot. And that made us lodging prone. We were cool and dry through stem, stem elongation. Uh, like the weather would not support lodging, but then with all those stems and mm -hmm. in June, when we hit grain fill, we had low, pho uh, low photosynthetically active radiation, our sunlight, we had cloud, we had smoke, we had smog. And so we didn't have a lot of sunlight and doggone if the wheat crop didn't rob the stem to fill the head. And now all of a sudden, because we robbed the stem and we had so many stems, even with a growth regulator, those crops sometimes was lodge. Was there genetic differences? Absolutely. But it was just bizarre how much lodging we had given what you would have expected. And, and that was an environmental factor and how, I mean, Jeremy, you know, he talked about putting it on at growth stage 30 to 32, somewhere in that range, that's, that's optimum. Well, at growth stage 31, Jeremy, I have no clue what my sunlight is going to be once I get to growth stage 60 when it heads out and through grain fill. Mm -hmm. And I have no opportunity then to make that call. So it, it's just, it's a moving target. It's really cool. We learned so much and yeah, I'm going to keep learning. It's, it's part of the fun of the job. It is the fun of the job. Yeah. And I, I, will, I will mention that, uh, um, Pete and Joanna Fallings, um, Omar for his uh, wheat specialist, obviously, um, met at the Syngenta Research Farm where you did a big, big trial, Pete, and uh, we filmed an episode for Ontario Diagnostic Days. And uh, you guys walked that whole site um, and some great learnings and some great insights. So you can check that out uh, on the uh, episode seven of Ontario Diagnostic Days if you're scrolling through Real Ag. And we will ac actually repost that, Lindsay. 
uh, right mm -hmm. after Christmas um, as a separate uh, feature. So look for that. Yep, absolutely. And and actually, I did want to mention um, we can't possibly in one show, even if we go a little long here, cover all of the top stories at all. Uh, we're going to try and give each crop <laughs> of that we do a school on, you know, a little bit of airtime. But, you know, we, we could talk about tar spot and corn, which that was a big part of Ontario Diagnostic Days this year as well. Um, we, you know, there's lots uh, to the soybean story as well on the on the early planting, you know, should soybeans go, be going in ahead of corn. Um, and then, of course, as we shift uh, west, you know, Jeremy, I, I do want to bring up zombie canola, which you told me that um, I was being um, ageist or something along those lines because it's not zombie canola because it wasn't dead. It was just sleeping. So I do want to talk about that, but I also want to talk about herbicide carryover, the risk of that, of course. Um, and one of the big questions, and I think it was Jason Vogt that brought it up in the, the comments, is in the drought situation we had out west where fertilizer didn't get used, um, and we potentially have quite a bit of nitrogen that was still there, let's say in the fall, can we count on that for 2022? But before I go to that one, Jeremy, explain zombie canola and why I'm wrong that it's actually a zombie. Well, I think for something to be a zombie, it would have to die and then come back, right? I, from my understanding, unless, unless my understanding of plant physiology is completely gapped, I think I think we <laughs> I want all of your nitrogen. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, I think what we're talking about here is you know that we had a lot of top death occur um and then or or you know it was harvested and then um it it regrew. It there was enough energy there the the bottom of the plants the root system um you know there was still enough energy and, and still enough drive there for those plants to come back. Um, you know, I, I won't pretend to fully understand the physiology, you know, each year brings up, you know, different, different environmental conditions that'll cause this, but yeah, um, not a zombie didn't die. Okay. It didn't die. So if Jim Hale is still watching, which I know he was on at the beginning, but, uh, he and I chatted this fall when he was harvesting and he said, I've got dead ripe canola that is flowering at the bottom. So like he's like i've never seen this before in my life like there was a branch that was still flowering when he was hard you know it was just just so bizarre um and just i suppose shows you just how extreme the the drought the temperatures that the year was out west and so so jay now i will go back to jason's comment if you want to put that comment back on there on anticipating nitrogen availability in 2022 because this is going to be a really big question so so pete you're nodding we'll start with you how much can farmers count on, do you think, or agronomists count on when, when advising their clients? So, so this has been another incredible learning for me this year because we typically wouldn't worry about volunteer regrowth in a crop like that. And in Western Canada, you soil sample in the fall for nitrogen and that nitrogen is still there in the spring. It's not true in Eastern Canada. Everybody from Eastern Canada, get over it. We, we start at zero every spring, have a nice day. That's the way it is. But in Western Canada, if, if the crop doesn't use that, whatever it was, 150 pounds of nitrogen, 100 pounds of nitrogen that you put on, and it only used 20 or 30 because it was so dry, the rest of that should have been available. But then you get this, I don't know, you can call it not zombie if you like, Jeremy, I don't care, call it what you will, but you get these plants that come back to life and they suck up that nitrogen. And in some of the data that John Hurd presented, uh, the, the, the wheat took up, the volunteer wheat took up 80 pounds of nitrogen. The volunteer canola, because canola is a luxury nitrogen feeder, 160 pounds of nitrogen out of the soil. And now you say, well, it's, it's organic form now. It's in the crop form. So, so that'll be available next year. Malarkey that's available next year. It doesn't cycle that fast. And so what we, what the growers did that slipped the clutch and, and it's so hard because this stuff regrows and you have no money because you've had no crop and it's been so dry. But if you didn't kill that volunteer canola, that volunteer wheat, and you let it suck up all that nitrogen, 
now i don't know is is 10 percent of that nitrogen available that that's in the crop maybe in canola it might be a little bit more than that but in wheat we know it's it's quite a low amount and so all that free nitrogen you thought you had from last year is not available for next year's crop and it, it just is a, an astounding story yeah so jeremy have you have like were you busy soil testing this fall and surprised by some of the numbers you got um, I think, I think some people were a little bit, I don't think the surprise was, would, would be the answer. I think those who were dry and, and, you know, I chatted with Ross McKenzie about this, you know, what kind of expectations can we have when we're in dry conditions? Well, you know, when we're 60% or less of, of average rainfall, you might be anticipating some kind of of extra nitrogen more than anticipated if you're above 80 percent, then you might be more in the typical range so i think those who had an extreme lack of rainfall were anticipating some type of extra nitrogen but some of them you know didn't get that extra nitrogen and maybe it was used up by some some secondary tillers that came or some secondary growth by some of that crop um, but yeah. i think i think you know this this then poses the question of of variability across the field um, cause like you said, in Western Canada, we don't start with zero. So if, if we do have parts of this of the field that are having this secondary growth that are using some of this nitrogen, then we're getting a lot of variability in what's available in the field. Um, and then what's available for next year. And then we're applying our nitrogen, um, when we're having much higher rates in some places than the others. So this is where soil sampling, composite soil sampling, um, you know, this is where we're going to have to make sure that we're getting a good assessment of what's going on in our field to be able to give the appropriate recommendations. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think those were surprised. I think some were disappointed. They were hoping for more, uh, but I don't, I don't think yeah. there was a lot of surprise. Yeah. Well, given the price of nitrogen, it'd be nice if there was a whole bunch of it that was still there. Um, and actually, I do want to send, so I will mention as, I mean, we're, we're nearing the end here for tonight. Um, we will be back January 10th. So we're going to take the next two Mondays off. Um, but uh, we're already starting to plan, of course, well into next year. And thank you to everyone who has been emailing with, with story ideas, things they want us to dig into to talk about. And one of the things that we are going to talk about probably in early February, so keep, keep tabs on that, is determining what your nitrogen rate is going to be your economical rate of nitrogen and we've done quite a bit of that in the corn school course this past year looking at that 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 uh, burn worked with uh, dr david hooker on so we're going to do more of that and start looking at some of that return that 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 um the nitrogen response curves and the cost of nitrogen and the cost of the crop we're going to do some of that because i think that's going to be a really big question in 2022 but of course based on a soil test or at least a reasonable, reasonably recent one. And this will be, so Jeremy, you actually win a hat or a shirt that says malarkey, apparently, according to John, um, because almost every single episode. Um, but there's no way I can beat Pete's hat. <laughs> <laughs> I know, so you need a shirt that says malarkey. Um, so, but, but soil testing probably has come up every single episode and and really just the importance of of doing it and and now we know full well that especially for areas of the west that didn't get a crop this year the idea to go out and spend more money into soil test um might seem you know in the spring might seem too tall in order but potentially it could make a really big difference if you don't have a recent soil test to go off of so um that's our little every every show we get we get a plug for soil testing so there you go um the, this will be though, and and thank you, Jeremy and Pete, for for sharing some of this as well of of that unknown with some of the regrowth that happened in the fall. Um, you know how much of that will have been used up or or those sorts of things. Now, Pete, I did want to quickly mention because um, John, I think mentioned it too, the incredible amount of regrowth after soybeans, like the edible yeah. beans and the soybeans. That I wish we had the picture loaded up because it was like a carpet. Oh like, yeah, and absolutely you know unbelievable. You've never seen that before. Have you seen that in all so, of your years? No. So, so to have soybeans actually regrowing at that level was bizarre. Just quite. Yeah. Uh, just I hadn't seen that before. Of course, in the hailed fields where you had yeah. those twenty bushels per acre hailed out, 
uh, man, we, we had soybean regrowth there like crazy. Yeah, and, and I think Warren's right that those soybeans are, are fairly low uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio. And, and that's why typically you'll get more residual nitrogen out of your canola crop than you will out of your wheat crop because of that difference in carbon to nitrogen ratio. So, so I think the, the nitrogen benefit uh, is is going to be okay out of those volunteer soybeans but I, I think uh, it was Jason maybe that said as well it's it's the length of the crop that you grow if you grow corn after those volunteer soybeans it's got a long nitrogen demand you'll get most of that nitrogen back if you're going to grow spring wheat or barley here that then you're not going to because it just it doesn't have enough time it doesn't grow long enough through the season mm-hmm. okay um Jim Jim is around thanks Jim for sticking around um, he says 80 to 90 pounds in durum stubble and 30 to 40 pounds in canola. I assume that means residual. So, uh, wow. Um, Jim farms near Lancer, Saskatchewan. And, and maybe he can remind me, but I think he had something like less than four inches of rain in the whole season. So, like, yeah. Maybe even less than that, Jim. You let me know. Um, I did want to, before we go, um, I did, again, remind everybody we're back January 10th. Um, a big shout out to our sponsor, Adam Canada, for uh, for sponsoring the show, making it happen. Um, it has been fantastic to see so many people in the comments. Great audience tonight. So thank thank you everyone for making time, uh, including us in oh. your Monday night. This is really fun. I really love doing this and fantastic questions from everybody. So make sure everyone zip me a note. If I if I don't get in touch with you soon, send me your mailing address, we'll get you a hat. Um, and Pete apparently promised hoodies. So I will <laughs> send on that request as well. Um, yeah, Jim says maybe three inches of rain. Um, so so there's that, that, that one stings. Um, as of course, CEU credits, head to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow. And Burn, as you pointed out, you worked incredibly hard this summer with Wheat Pete, with so many of the OMAFRA staff putting together Ontario Diagnostic Days. Jeremy, you're a huge part of our wheat school. Peter, you as well, and Real Ag Radio. Remember that all of these things live on Real Agriculture all the time. You can go back, look at past episodes. Uh, we're on YouTube as well. Um, so if, uh, if, if people have questions, comments, story ideas, let us know. This is what we cover. And of course, the archive is there to go back and to dig through. So we really appreciate it. Um, and Ray, of course, there's a couple of people I think who, who probably have not missed an episode. And I know Warren is one of them. So maybe they will get a hoodie. You never know. All right, Peter, Byrne, Jeremy, thank you so much for this evening, for sharing your time. Um, and happy holidays to all and stay safe, everyone. We'll see you in January. Good night, happy everyone. Holidays. Happy holidays. See you. Bye. Cheers, everyone. Bye.